The Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Welcome, guys, to another Vaccination Database Seminar series. We're excited today to have uh, Stephen Bill. He is a manager at Dremio, and he's going to talk to us about the query optimization, acceleration, and execution uh, in the Dremio database management system. So as always, if you have any questions for Stephen as he gives his talk, feel free to interrupt him at any time. Uh, unmute yourself, say who you are, and ask your question, and feel free to do this anytime. And that way, he's not talking to himself for an hour on Zoom. So with that, Stephen, thank you so much for being here. Uh, go for it. Great. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I'm really uh, excited to uh, have this opportunity. Um, so like I said, yeah, I'm here to talk about Dremio. Um, as you can see from this first slide that we're, we're we call ourselves the, the SQL Lakehouse platform. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the, you know, just query optimization, acceleration, and execution. Uh, so who are we? All right, this is uh, a diagram. Um, it's a little bit, a little bit of a marketing diagram, but I, you know, I'll just you know show it here. You see the, the, the you know, this pyramid here. We have the the base layers, the uh, you know cloud storage. Um, Dremio kind of sits in between the cloud storage and data scientists and BI users. Um, so, uh, so what we offer is a fundamentally different way to deliver analytics. Uh, um, and like I said, Dremio sits between the data lake storage and end user tools uh, and our product consists of two key areas. The first component is a scalable high performance query engine that allows you to query data in place as it resides in data lake storage. Um, so this is be one way how we're different from a cloud data warehouse or a, a database. Um, and the second uh, component is, oh, sorry. And it's not just for exploring data. Dremio was built from the ground up to deliver high performing BI dashboards and interactive analytics on data lake storage and we do this by baking in a collection of query acceleration technologies. And the second key component is our semantic layer, which is the experience we provide for both technical and non-technical users. Uh, for technical users, our semantic layer enables teams to assign consistent meaning to data that can be leveraged by any downstream application instead of needing to create individual definitions and calculated fields and isolated BI tools. Uh, for data analysts and data scientists to discover, curate, analyze, and share data sets in a self-service manner, it's a great experience for data analysts because now they can run high-performing dashboards on their data immediately without needing to wait for it to land in the data warehouse, and they can easily integrate as much data as they need into their dashboards without needing to call upon their data engineering counterparts. Uh, one of the neat things for analysts is that all our query acceleration technologies work transparently so they can query data in its logical form without having to connect to specific tables or materializations. It's also a great experience for data engineers because now that line of business users can analyze data on their own terms, engineers can focus on more strategic projects instead of maintaining data pipelines. Okay, so that's kind of the uh, high level view, a little bit, little bit, of, little bit of a marketing take at it, um, but I wanted to you know, get that out of the way, just kind of explain what is Dremio just from a very high level. Um, if there are any questions, you know, Feel free to jump in, but uh, you know if not, we can get into the more technical side of the uh, of the of the talk. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, Dremio is built upon open source technologies. Uh, here are a few of the uh, you know the uh, open source uh, frameworks that we're that we're using. Uh, the first one that I'm most interested in is Apache Calcite, uh, which is a, the query optimizer framework. Um, another one equally as important to Dremio is Apache Arrow, um, which is our in-memory columnar storage format. Um, and in fact, you know, Dremio was instrumental in the uh, launching of this uh, Apache Arrow project. And although a lot of other groups outside of Dremio have contributed vast amounts to it, you know, we were there at the, the very beginning and continue to uh, you know, work with that community. Um, within the Apache Arrow, uh, specifically, one thing that we've that we've added was the uh, what we call Gandiva, um, which is the LLV, LLVM based analytical expression compiler um, that works against you know natively against the Arrow uh, uh, memory format. Uh, a more recent uh, uh, component that we've added is it, it is uh, Apache Arrow Flight, 
Um, this is a framework for fast data transport. Um, uh, Apache Parquet is another one that we that we use is kind of our default columnar storage you know format uh, for you know for, for storing the data. Um, I think to some extent Apache Parquet has, has become in the in the big data world the the, the default already for columnar storage. Um, and another, uh, you know, finally, uh, Apache Iceberg, um, a table format for large data sets. Um, this is another one that we're extensively using and also we're involved in the community uh, to try to promote. Um, and you might ask, what is the difference between a, uh, a, a storage format versus a table format? And I think uh, Vivek might get into some more details about that later. So I'll leave that to him. All right. Uh, just a, also one quick slide about who who are we. So, um, so I am. My name is Stephen Phillips. I'm currently the uh, the manager of the Query Optimizer team. Um, a little bit about my background. I, I'm actually a physics PhD dropout. Um, uh, I'm also a committer and you know PMC member of uh, on Apache Drill and Apache Arrow. Uh, and I'm also you know, I've been at Dremio since basically the beginning. I'm not a founder, but I joined pretty much immediately after the the company was started. Um, and I've, I've only been a manager for the last uh, year and a half or so. Before that, I was just an individual contributor and tech lead. Um, and I have not always been working on Query Optimizer. That's, you know, for the past uh, couple of years. Before that, I worked on execution, uh, you know, runtime operators, uh, you know, various uh, storage connectors and so on. Um, and then I'll just go ahead and introduce Vivek as well. Uh, you know, he, he uh, we actually, I worked with Vivek uh, for about 10 years now at both at Dremio and our previous company at uh, Mapbar Technologies. Um, so uh, as you can see, Vivek has a PhD in computer science from Georgia Tech, and he's uh, uh, you know, a really, really great distributed systems engineer. So, oh, I just wanted to mention one thing, uh, Andy, that um, uh, I've actually watched a few of your uh, class uh, lectures. Um, I do recall at one point you mentioned something about physics, people with physics background being great at optimizers. Um, True. I don't know. How, I don't. I'm not. I'm not using myself as a as a data point in proof of that. I just thought it was an interesting like, I, and I don't know if this proves anything, but I thought that was an interesting point to make out. So I included the the physics PhD dropout is what what, what type of physics? <laughs> well, you know, uh, yeah. I, like I said I was a dropout. I, my research was in experimental uh, nuclear uh, physics. Um, but like I said, I high energy, high, high energy physics. Uh, it would be mid mid energy physics, so it was not CERN CERN level. It was okay. Um, you know, so yeah. Okay, awesome. Keep going. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So first off, let's talk about query planning. This is this is my my area of expertise. Um, so like I said, we, we use the Apache outside. Uh, um, so um, so CalSite, and this is taken from their GitHub. Uh, provides an industry standard SQL parser and validator, a customizable optimizer with pluggable rules and cost functions, logical and physical algebraic operators, various transformation algorithms from SQL to algebra. All right. Um, so we use CalSite extensively throughout our optimizer. However, it's not it's not as simple as saying that we simply use CalSite in an optimizer. Thing. Like it's CalSite is a framework that provides a lot of the building blocks for, for an optimizer, but how it actually gets used is is basically what our job is at Dremio and the optimizer team, as well as you know working in and in, in enhancing and fixing bugs in CalSite itself. So where is it actually used? Um, so here are, the, here are the basic steps in the query optimizer where CalSite is used. Uh, first off, in parsing, uh, you know, and essentially you know parsing the SQL means converting from a SQL string to a uh, you know a SQL parse tree. Um, the next step is validation. Uh, validation is the process of you know verifying that the not only is the the syntax parsable but it does it actually make sense does it actually uh you know reference columns that exist and do does it match the function signature and do the types match and so on um finally the well not finally the next step then is uh converting to what you might call the abstract syntax tree or the logical plan uh, and finally um is the optimization. There's actually multiple phases of optimization, uh, optimization uh, in the Dremio optimizer. And the, the goal of optimization is to go from this initial logical plan into a optimal physical plan. 
or at least what we think is an optimal optimal physical plan. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So in calcite, there are two types of planners, and each phase of planning uses you know one of these one of these two types, um, and they are heuristic and uh, volcano planner. So the heuristic uh, planner is you could also consider it to be a rule based planner. Basically, it's, it uh, you takes a set of rules and applies them over and over again until they don't. You know, don't apply. And each, each each time you apply a rule, it transforms the tree and throws away the old the old one. And finally, it, you know, once it once it's applied the rules that it can, that's the end of that phase of optimization. Uh, whereas the volcano planner um, is a is a cost based optimizer and uses uh, dynamic programming. And as rules are being applied, it keeps track of all equivalent uh, alternatives. And then after it's exhaustively explored the space of possible plans chooses the uh, you know, best cost plan. Um, so what, like I said before, Dremio has multiple phases of planning and different phases use, will use you know, either, either heuristic or volcano planner. Um, and the, uh, you know, some of the examples of phases that we use for heuristic planning include the, uh, we call the reduced expression phase. This does a lot of constant reduction, uh, removal of redundant casts, et cetera. Uh, we have a phase that's really focused on filter pushdown, um, including the what we call the transit predicate inference across joins, um, and then finally we also do join optimization in a heuristic phase as well. However, it, it's a little bit misleading. Um, uh, it's 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 kind of a, more of a hybrid heuristic and uh, volcano plan, uh, planner because uh, because cost does does come into play as well. Um, I won't go into the, too many details about that right now. But, um, these are just in, the Calcite library provides a couple of you know, key framework for optimizer. One is a rel node. Uh, this is the basics, you know, the basic node for the logical plan, um, and it, it expresses a relation. And you know, an example would be a, a filter, project, join, etc. Um, now these rel nodes can also you know can represent both logical and physical concepts. Uh, you know, for example, a logical aggregate um, would be an aggregate node that is, you know, implementation agnostic, whereas a hash aggregate is a specific physical implementation of aggregate. And then uh, rel opt rule is the is the uh, the base class for uh, rules um, that both the both types of planners are understand. Um, and so a rule represents a logical valid transformation of part of the plan. Um, and you know a, a few examples of what uh, the purposes for a rule could be, um, you know, to rewrite the plan in a way that is possibly more efficient. For example, pushing filter below join. Um, you know, uh, another example would be you know converting one type of rel node to another, i.e., logical to physical, a logical join to hash join. Um, we also use the, these rules for for logical rewrites. Um, a simple example would be, you know, the average function can get converted to some combination of a sum and count. Um, so those are some of the, the uses of rules. All right. So moving on, the next topic I want to talk about is statistics. Um, and here's the problem is that the volcano pl planner um, and, and also the join optimizer, they need to have accurate estimates if they're going to make, uh, uh, um, you know, optimal plans. Um, it relies on estimates of things like selectivity and row count quite a bit. Um, and it turns out, you know, and bad guesses can result in very bad plans. And the, you know, one example would be a, a massively expanding join followed by a filtering join. Um, and in case that's not clear what that means is that sometimes a join, especially if there's lots of duplicate values on the join key on both sides of the join can result in a very large input coming from an sorry, a very large output from a relatively small input. A filtering join would be one that after the join, there's not many rows remaining. So uh, ideally we'd want to plan it, the, the, the join such that the filtering join comes first and then the expanding join, you know, follows second. Um, so this is something that the optimizer tries to do. Um, so the solution that, you know, that we can use to, uh, to improve this is with, with uh, statistics. Um, so here are some of the statistics that we 
collect. Now, right now, this is a manual task. I, I, it's not mentioned here, but um, there's an analyze table command. Um, but then the, the statistics that we collect right now are the following. Uh, first off, approximate count distinct. Um, this is this is done using a hyperlog log sketch. Um, and this you know, provides better estimates for things like filter selectivity, aggregate row count, um, and join, join output size. Uh, we also collect uh, another sketch called uh, T-Digest. Um, this essentially functions as a in place of a histogram. Uh, T-Digest is a sketch that allows you to, as an input, you know, say I want some percentile, say I want 50th percentile or 99th percentile or whatever, and it will return approximately what, you know, what value represents that uh, um, would, would be for that uh, percentile. And finally, we have an items sketch, um, which is you know, used to solve the heavy hitter problem, which is useful for identifying skew and also can uh, give better filter selectivity estimation in some cases. Um, Hi, one thing about all of these, yes. Uh, Jim Apple, Facebook here. Um, mm -hmm. How does uh, hyperlog log solve the filter selectivity problem? Uh, well, it, it doesn't completely solve it. I, I was just say it, it helps um, in that, uh, like compared to nothing, if we don't know anything about the, so the, the cardinality of a, of a field that we're uh, filtering on, um, we, we really just have no way of knowing, like if we apply this filter, what is the, what is the selectivity? Um, we can make, at least make a better estimate, um, you know, and a better educated guess, um, if, uh, if all we had is, a, is approximate count distinct based on, um, you know, we, could, we can say, well, let's take, if, if we know that there's, uh, you know, the, the, the row count is, you know, X and the, the distinct count is Y, well, then selectivity of Y divided by X is a better estimate than what we had before. But I agree with you that it's not, it's, just, it's not perfect. It doesn't take into account the, uh, you know, the, the, the skew and so forth. So these other ones also help with that too. Like it's, it, uh, does that make sense? Yep. Um, yeah. Thank so you. yeah, that's a very good point. It doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem. I don't want to say that it's, it's, but it, it's better than, it's better than nothing. So, you know, but the basic idea is, uh, you know, a filter on a, a equality filter on a, a low cardinality field, we can, we can guess we'll have a, um, a higher selectivity than one on a high cardinality field. So, so. but yes, T digest, at least for numeric uh, range queries is much, it will be much more useful in a lot, in a lot of cases. And then you know, item sketch, if we, if we know that we're, we're filtering to select for a high, a high uh, incidence uh, value, then you, you know, we can take that into account as well. Right, but thanks, good question. Um, maybe, one thing to note maybe, about all, I'll say. Maybe you're going to get to this later, but like, um, this is, you know, this is the classic data's problem. Like how good are your stats? You know, the quality of your stats affect the decisions that your optimizer makes. And, it, and maybe you'll get this when you talk about query execution, but is there anything you guys do in the query executor that is sort of can be adaptive to wrong statistics or you, you, you bake the, you bake the query plan once and just run it no matter what? Um, so I, I can't the, the, the answer is uh, right now we bake the query plan once. Um, we have we have work in progress, you know, for for there there are some features currently in in progress that will hopefully be coming out in the next within the next couple of months that actually do relate to adaptive ex execution, um, uh, specifically around I think uh, aggregate uh, um, aggregations. Um, but we don't, uh, the, the way that Dremio's execution is built is very, we call it very like, optimistic execution. Um, essentially, yeah, we plan everything, we schedule everything up front. And um, so the, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't lend itself very well to adapting very much um, at runtime. Um, so this, this is definitely an area that we're, you know, we, we're, we're working on. Um, Specifically, like the, the general approach that we're more inclined to take is to adapt by uh, starting over. As in, like you know, run the query again, learn from learn from the first query, and then and then run 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 a, a better plan the second time around. Um, Why don't you try turning off your camera because it's still getting jumbled? Okay, yeah. I'll I'll Photoshop Brad Pitt into the sure. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay. 
hopefully this hopefully this helps a little bit. Um, okay. But yeah, sorry, sorry if that wasn't clear. Yeah. So yeah, the approach that we're that we're working with, like like I said, there are some adaptive execution enhancements being made, but from my standpoint, most of the the, the approach I think you know works for us for us is to learn between between runs of the query. So maybe the first time you run, uh, it'll, it won't be a great plan, but then the second time you run, it'll, it'll be improved because we've collected, um, uh, we, we've learned, we've learned some things about the query. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. All right, and then Hamid has questions. Yeah, so regarding the statistics, uh, my understanding is that uh, you're running SQL queries to collect the statistics. So when you want to do the column cardinality, you end up with a large number of aggregate functions with distinct, that count distinct. The SQL engines are not really good at because they focus on precise answer instead of a statistical answer. So do you have a special SQL for your statistical call, the stat collection? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, not really, it's not really a special SQL. So we have function, uh, uh, splittable function uh, implementations for, for all of these. So um, one, thing, one thing to note about these three sketches is that they're all mergeable. Um, what that means is you can, you can collect partial, partial sketches uh, you know, on portions of the data and then merge the, the results into one final uh, sketch or you know, data structure. Um, so this allows for you know, both uh, uh, parallel execution, but also incremental updates of these, of these stats. So, so yes, we have uh, we have SQL functions. We have, we have you know special aggregate functions for computing uh, hyperlog log, p digest, and item sketch. Does that answer your question? Yeah, you're done. Okay, so these functions are also available to like data scientists, or it's only internal to you? Um, okay, that's a interesting question. Um, technically, they are available. We don't block anyone from using them, but they're not exactly like technically supported, I guess. Uh, functions um they're they're kind of meant to be internal um if if we started getting you know customers who wanted to use these then we would uh um you know that's something we maybe we would we would uh publish some more documentation on them and best practices or whatever so right now they're kind of meant to be only internal but technically not okay no one's blocked from using them yeah okay good thank you okay all right thanks great questions the last question is how often do you run? Someone wants to know how often you run analyze because in the lake house, you know, you have many different writers, so you don't have you know, an exact view of what the, 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 the churn rate yeah. of, of data. Right now, it basically it's a uh, admin admin driven. They'll run it uh, as as they need. Um, but this is one of the areas that we're looking to make more of an automatic. You know, we don't at a high level at Dremio, we don't like to have. Um, you know, admins having to turn a lot of knobs and, you know, have to do this sort of thing. Um, so right now I look at stats as more of a, it's a tool for our customers to use to get out of like, you know, when, when they see that they have some queries that are performing badly, this is something they can use to, to improve things. I, I would not recommend that they go and run analyze table on every table in their system um, every day, you know, blindly. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of costs and expense associated with that. Um, you know, the, the idea is that, you know, hopefully before too long, this has become more of an automatic automated thing that the customer doesn't even have to think about, but we're not there yet. So, um, and I, I know Andy, you probably have a lot to, a lot to say about this sort of thing. Cause I'm, you know, with the work you're doing in Ottertune and, and so on probably is, I'm, I'm sure this is something that interests you. <laughs> Yeah, that's another conversation. Keep going. Yeah. Okay. So uh, anyway, next we have uh, materializations, which we call reflections. Um, it's a marketing term, but uh, like I said, reflections are very similar to materialized views. Um, basically, we can we can accelerate queries by computing, uh, pre-computing expensive data cleansing operations, pre-compute aggregates, and denormalize joins. Um, and but we can create uh, materializations on both views and on the base tables. Um, uh, and the reason it, you know it's beneficial to create reflections on a base table is you know a couple of a couple of examples would be you know it, if it's used to rewrite the data from some inefficient format such as CSV or JSON into a much more efficient 
format, uh, you know, columnar format, which is a uh, parquet. Um, it also allows the specifying of partition and sort columns, uh, which allows for, you know, partition pruning and page skipping. Um, and then the optimizer, you know, will determine which reflections satisfy the query and then choose the, you know, the best uh, reflection option among all possible choices. So here's just a, I just want to go through a few examples of some of the types of situations where aggregation or sorry where reflections uh, can be used. Uh, so one, you know, it would be if we have a uh, you know maybe a filter on top of an aggregate project scan query, and you can see here that the the user query is aggregating on col grouping by column A and computing some sum on column C. Now the materialization was created with a you know a similar aggregate, but it's grouping on both A and B. Well, our our optimizer can figure out that this you know this materialization satisfies this query, but needs to rewrite with a rollup aggregation, um, you know, to, to group by just a, um, and so it, we 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 able we're able to rewrite the 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 user's query to a new query that uses the uh, the reflection. Um, another one is the uh, uh, join aggregation uh, transposition. So you can see here the original user query is doing an aggregate on top of a join of you know, tables T1 and T2. We have a materialization that is only an aggregate on uh, table you know, T1. Well, the, we were able to figure out that we can push the aggregate uh, below, the, uh, below the join um, and, and match the reflection and then uh, do a roll-up aggregation on top of the join. Um, so this is a very common use case with, you know, a lot of times with like a star schema type thing where you have a fact table joined with, you know, various dimension tables. Um, you, you can create your ag reflections on just the fact table um, and not to worry about, you know, denormalizing the joins and aggregate and so on. So um, this, this another should, use case. Yeah, this should assume that the join is lossless because if the query join is lossy, then some tuples will be left out and your aggregate value is going to be different than the material as well. So it effectively requires referential integrity to do that. We do that in DB2, exactly this optimization, but it has to be lossless. Um, because joins yes. will eliminate rows, right? And then the aggregates will be different if it is lossy. Um, well, so... Um, I guess uh, maybe maybe we can take that. I don't I don't want to take too much time on that. Uh, uh, we maybe we can discuss that offline or something. Um, yeah, yeah, that's all right. Just go ahead. The, uh, we'll see the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So because uh, um, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. That, that's a good question. Um, so this this slide right here is a, is a simple case where we have a, um, the materializations are partitioned by different columns. So we're running some query that is the column A, we see that we have two reflections, but one is partitioned by A, the other one's partitioned by B. You know, it will choose the, the correct one and then, and, and then prune the, uh, the, 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 the table based on column A. And then finally, we have a, a feature which, call, which we, call, we call Starflake. Um, now, this is actually more related to what I think you were just asking about a second ago about, about, about the uh, lossless. Um, so the issue that comes up is that let's say we create a, a materialized view on top of uh, you know some some thread, a three way join you know maybe we have a you know some fact table joined with two different dimension tables and we materialize that but then we have some query that's only you know looking at the fact table joined with one of the dimension tables all right well generally speaking we can't use the materialization because the the we don't know for sure if the uh, the join is is lossless. I think which I think was what you were talking about. It, it could be the materialization could uh, this this the the join that we're not including in the query could have removed rows or it could have added rows. Um, and so we actually, without doing something special, we can't use this materialization. However, if the if this join if these joins are what you might call uh, extension joins. I've, I've also heard the, heard the term uh, cardinality preserving. Then, um, then it's okay. And so, actually, what we do is when we when we create the materialization, we 
check and see, well, was this join cardinality preserving? And if it was, we keep track of that. And then automatically, you know, when we see this happening, we will take that into account and, um, and, we, and, we, can, and we can use the implementation query, even though um, the query does not include all the joins. So, um, and so automatically the, the user generally shouldn't have to even, you know, think about this. Um, not to do anything for this to work is what I, um, what I mean by that. All right, so that's that's all the slides I have for. Uh, for um, are there any questions uh, before I hand over to uh, Vivek? Um, yeah, hello everyone. This is uh, Vivek. I'm going to go over um, some of the challenges specifically in query execution. Um, so, Stephen, can you go to the next slide, please? All right, so um, I think the, the first set of challenges are to do with uh, really large data sets, right? So we have some customers who have millions of files in S3 and that constitutes a table for them. Right? Um, so one of the challenges that Dremio has is uh, prior to running a query, uh, we need to collect um, the committed data and just, just to identify uh, all the files that belong to the table and you know, organize them so we can quickly um, uh, run a query on that. Um, so the way Premier was doing this earlier was uh, we would uh, store this metadata in an internal database. Um, and uh, this, this entire metadata, we, we were organizing it by partitions. And by partitions, I mean, like most of these tables and data sets are you know, partition by, you can take an example of, like maybe they're partitioned by year and month, right? Uh, so year 2020 Jan, and there's a bunch of files related to that. And year 2020 Feb, there are a bunch of files related to that. So there are two columns here, year and month, uh, which are like columns, which are partition columns. Um, so th this entire metadata that Remy was storing was, uh, was organized in that fashion, right? So you had, um, like a tuple year and month, uh, followed by a whole bunch of files that belong to that tuple. Um, and during planning, um, the planner was uh, essentially reading this metadata um, and uh, applying where clauses on these partition columns to 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 prune all the, the files that don't need to be read. Um, and and once these files were read, then planner had a good idea of which are the files that actually need to be processed and that's how it creates the plan. And so the drawback, uh, one of the drawbacks was that uh, one, the planner is, I guess, doing too much work. Uh, it's not only computing a lot of stuff, it's also uh, reading a lot of data from its internal database, right? Um, in, like in data sets with millions of files that uh, tends to be a problem. Um, and uh, so it's basically single threaded or it's bottlenecked on a single node. Um, and we are not able to start um, reading the data files until the planner is done with all of this and you know creates a distributed query plan and ships it off to all the worker nodes. Um, the second problem uh, kind of related is um, in, in join queries, uh, how do we avoid uh, like, like can, can we do better at uh, limiting the number of files that we want to read? Um, and so I want to kind of start with these problems and if there's time, we can go ahead with uh, some of the other problems that uh, we've been uh, working on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, um, so, so recently uh, we switched the way we collect metadata and store metadata, uh, as opposed to storing it in our own custom uh, table, uh, uh, internal table. Uh, we started using uh, Apache Iceberg uh, where we can. Um, and uh, so a couple of points about Apache Iceberg, it, it's an open source project, uh, but it also offers um, uh, transaction, uh, asset transactions on tables um, in, in the data lake. Um, and uh, uh, so Apache, uh, 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 like the iceberg table format has metadata files, uh, which identify all the files that belong to the data set. But in addition to that, it also annotates each and every file with the partitions they belong to. And for each file, it has um, 
uh, upper and lower bounds for each of the columns in the file, right? And these can be used in, in uh, cloning as many files as possible. Um, so with the new um, execution flow, the query planning execution flow, um, the planner very quickly decides that uh, it's going to use the, uh, the iceberg table format for uh, query execution. And uh, the, the plan that it generates uh, now has uh, two different scan operators. Um, Right. So one is a metadata scan and, this, this, and, and, and the metadata scan feeds data into the data scan. Uh, so the metadata scan is essentially reading iceberg uh, manifest file. So it can happen in parallel. It's not, it's not restricted to a single node, it's, it can be parallelized. Um, and uh, the, so there are like based on the query, uh, we add filter operators on top of the metadata scan. Uh, to take advantage of all the partition column information and the upper lower bounds of that to, to eliminate as many files as possible. And uh, this filtered set of data files uh, go to the data scan operator. Um, so with this mechanism, we've been able to um, get parallelism in all the uh, metadata scan operations and also in the uh, partition pruning that the planner was doing on a single node. Uh, we managed to parallelize it. Uh, we also managed to uh, start the metadata scan and the data scan concurrently, right? I mean, like for large tables, uh, uh, if your filter is very selective, you know, the data scan can uh, proceed along with the metadata scan and helps query finish sooner. Um, the other big benefit for us is that it, it reduced the memory requirement uh, on the planner and, and improved uh, reliability. So how does the data skipping work? Are you using Iceberg for that? Yeah, we, uh, yeah so we do Iceberg. We, so we do use Iceberg for that. So um, the, the metadata scan operator is essentially reading your manifest files, right? And the manifest file has, uh, for each data file, it has uh, the partition column values and the lower upper and lower bounds for the individual, the non-partition columns. So we apply the where clauses um, on, on that data that comes out of uh, the metadata scan. So in terms of reliability improvements, this is because you're no longer quite as dependent upon the metadata single machine, single point of failure as you used to be? It's, it's more of the amount of memory that is required. Um, you know, with, with, with such large data sets, right? Um, it, it, like, like millions of files, uh, especially uh, if a file name is huge, right? I mean, 200 byte file names on S3 and stuff, it is like, it requires huge amounts of memory uh, in planning, especially if you're loading all the metadata uh, in the memory. So it keeps you away from reliability issues like UMI. Yes. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, so this is, um, we call it on time filtering. I'm sure you've kind of seen something similar. Um, so I have a SQL query to the right, which is, uh, I, so, so I went to Georgia Tech. So, uh, so this is a query that's trying to uh, find the sum of sales um, happened within Georgia Tech, right? Within that zip code. <coughs> um, so uh, it, it's doing a join on the store table and the sales table, the sales table being the larger table. Um, and, and in this case, um, it's not really known at planning time, um, all the store IDs uh, within that particular geographical area, right? We know there's a quote, but we don't know the store IDs. Uh, so it's really hard to you know uh, figure out how do I, reduce the number of files that I want to be reading on the probe site. Uh, because the store IDs could be handful, like five or 10, because the, it's, it's a very uh, narrow query, right? Uh, restricted query. Um, so the solution in this case, uh, Stephen, can you uh, next slide, please? Um, so, so in this case, uh, so during query execution, what we do is uh, once we're done uh, reading the build guide uh, table completely, um, the, the data structure or the hash table that is created at the join side 
uh, we know exactly the store IDs that we're interested in, and they're, they're, they're a much restrictive subset, right? So we, we take those and send it as a runtime uh, filter um, uh, to the scan at that point. And the scan is again has these um, all the, so all these statistics that we talked about, right? Upper and lower bound statistics uh, typically, um, and those statistics are used and and also the partition column information. Those are used to eliminate a large percentage of the files that need to be detected in this case. Um, so this is something that we implemented recently, and uh, uh, we've seen. Quite a bit of performance improvement. I'll talk about the numbers a little bit later. Next slide. Yes. Next slide. Um, uh, the uh, two challenges um, that I wanted to talk about. One is um, like uh, uh, so we need to uh, evaluate complex expressions um, in both uh, the filter, the where clause, and the project operators. Um, and in traditional relational databases, right? I mean, there, there are indexes which kind of narrow down the number of rows that you have to apply these expressions on. Um, but um, in 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 data lakes and stuff, there are really no indexes um, at this point of time. Uh, so we end up having to evaluate these expressions on on a large number of rows, and we need to do it fast, right? And the queries need to come up. So a couple of things that help us here are uh, Arrow, which is like Stephen said, it's a columnar memory layout, and and the uh, code generation that we do. It. I'll talk about that uh, in the next few slides. Um, and then um, and then this whole notion of if you're running queries against data sets in S3 or Azure all the time, uh, how are you going to deal with those network latencies, right? Um, the traditional prefetching techniques that people use, um, you kind of overlap I.O. with computation, um, uh, like don't work really well with columnar file formats because um, as you're reading like four different columns, right? And those four columns are not contiguous in the parquet file. Um, so you have to, you know, your traditional, um, Assuming the file is going to be sequentially accessed, it's not going to work. And this, the Parker file is going to be so it's, it's, it's so it's going to be randomly accessed. Um, so we needed to come up with a different solution, and uh, caching is the favorite solution, right? And uh, so designing a cache for like huge amounts of data, like hundred terabyte worth of data, has like some interesting challenges. Um, we can talk about that. Next slide. Um, so Arrow, um, so this is like a very brief introduction to Arrow. I believe um, uh, Wes is going to talk about Arrow in a couple of weeks um, in this group. Weeks, um, yes. Yeah, so I'm not going to spend much time on that, um, except for, you know, like it, it's a columnar format. So so here is um, a table with three columns, name, age, and phones. And we'll talk about the age column first. Age is an integer, right? Um, so, so Arrow stores integers in four bytes, and uh, if you if you want to store a whole bunch of rows, then you know you, you allocate that much amount of memory, and and you lay them out sequentially in memory, right? Um, um, uh, name is a string or a varchar column, and uh, it is laid out in memory using two uh, uh, blobs of memory. Uh, one is the values where you know the individual values like Joe and Jack are laid down sequentially. So there are no column separators, uh, no slash zero or anything like that. No column separators. Uh, but 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 then you have another offset memory, um, which kind of tells you both the length and also the offset uh, into uh, where the values are. For example, if I want to read um, uh, the first row of name. Uh, right, so I go into the offset vector and I find that the first row of name in the name column starts at offset three, um, and it has a length of four because the second one starts at seven. Seven minus three is four, so I read the four characters there, and that's that's my name. Um, right, so uh, that that's how um, the variable length columns are encoded, and similarly the lists, uh, the arrays, uh, in this case the phone number, um, it's encoded using three. Um, 
blobs of memory. The values um, very similar to the name uh, values column. Um, the string offsets again are uh, offsets into that, and and then there's another offset vector for the list, right? Uh, Next slide, please. Tim. Yeah, so um, arrow, uh, uh, as you can see, is like uh, uh, as opposed to row wise layout, it's a columnar layout. Um, it's randomly accessible, which is, I think, uh, a very good thing for us. Um, and, and it can take advantage of modern CPU architectures, uh, the pipelining and uh, assembly instructions. So, for example, one of the things that uh, we are able to do is if the host machine has uh, large or wide registers, right, 128 bit wide regist registers. Uh, so, we, so we can load four begins uh, into that register and then, and then do uh, simply operations on two registers. We want to add uh, two different columns, uh, two different begin columns. Uh, we, we could just add them instead of, you know, uh, uh, doing it four times. Uh, so that helps us with uh, like helps us vectorize it and all that stuff. Um, and also because it's columnar um, uh, and, and, and we deal with columns, right? So for example, if, if, if we want to send only the uh, name and age columns on the wire, not, not the phones column on the wire, right? If I want to send only the name and age columns in the wire, uh, I could continue to use scattergather IO um, to, to take the data and write it to a TCP buffer. Uh, without having to do another memory copy. Uh, so all of these kind of help uh, improve performance with Arrow. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, so this is um, uh, uh, so another like uh, one of the things that we had to do uh, to uh, to to get performance for while evaluating large expressions. Um, so let me introduce LLVM. Uh, so, so LLVM is um, a collection of compiler tools uh, that helps you uh, generate code uh, based on the host architecture um, on the target machine at runtime, right? And, and, and you can write code in different languages, C++ and everything, and, and get it to compile. Um, it's, um, it, it supports a wide range of compiler optimizations. Uh, and, and you can actually choose which optimizations you want to apply um, so you can get very efficient code. Uh, and, and it allows uh, code generation and static and runtime. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but this is, this is what we use um, to, to dynamically generate code at very execution time uh, based on the uh, expression that comes right as part of the filter operator or the project operator. Uh, we use uh, LLVM uh, to generate code on the host machine so it runs uh, very fast for us. Next slide, please. Um, so, effectively, what happens is um, uh, if you think of your abstract syntax tree. Uh, for an expression, right? So the, the the internal nodes of the tree are like functions. There could be an extract here function or like a regex function there. And so typically, uh, uh, what we do with Gandiva is we implement all these functions in C um, and, uh, and and LLVM allows you to take that C code, the first the the box on the top, which is the static code generation. It allows you to add compile time, take all those uh, functions that you have written in C++ and, and compile it into a uh, uh, IR format uh, for later use. Right? And at this point of time, all that is done is all these SQL functions are converted to an IR format. Um, and um, and the, the runtime code generation is, is reserved for like conditional blocks or a boolean and or an operator or a case statement. Um, and uh, that is runtime generated with all the optimizations one would expect, right? Um, uh, and, and the combination of these two uh, is, is merged into a single uh, uh, LLVM code block, uh, which is compiled uh, to the target machine, and that's how we get the uh, final machine code for execution. 
and this has uh, given us, as the results would show, it has given us huge performance improvements up to like 90x uh, improvement, especially when the expressions are large. Um, Out of curiosity, have you guys, instead of instead of sort of taking the the C plus plus code of like the the built in functions, converting them to IR, then inlining them in the in the query plan you're generating dynamically. Have you seen, have you measured the performance difference of, of having the dynamic cogen for the query plan invoke the C, the C functions as if, you know, that are already pre-compiled versus inlining them? I guess the question is, I mean, the question is, what's the, how much benefit are you seeing, seeing by merging them together and then doing the cross compilation or cross uh, optimizations? Um, so we haven't actually done what, what you said, but I think so. For, so one of the things that for us, like we we so we do not know on which machines customers will choose to run Remio, right? So um, it becomes very difficult for us to, uh, I guess, do what you said um, because like so so we cannot. Um, but you have a Jemio binary running, right? So the Jemio binary would have to have this pre-compiled. Built, SQL built-ins. Yeah, so all of these are statically linked into the Dremio binary. There's there's no dynamic dependency, so we do not assume that, uh, uh, that there are, like for example, boost libraries on the host machine that is running. So everything no, that Dremio uses no, is, is, is so the fine. question is like you have this registry of, of all the IR for these built-ins, right? Mm -hmm. And then then when you dynamically at runtime you generate the code, the IR for the query plan. Then you're injecting the IR of the built-ins, and then you take then you take that giant IR you know, the module of IR, and you pass up the LLVM and let LLVM compile all at once. An alternative is that you generate IR that then makes uh, you know function jumps, function calls into the pre-compiled uh, SQL built-ins. And I was just curious whether like you 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 whether you compared them, and it sounds like it sounds like no, 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 we haven't done that. Okay. Because some some LLVM engines actually do what I what I say. It's like pre-compile the, the built-ins and just call them at runtime. Um, you guys might be the only ones that actually do this IR registry thing. I'm just curious how much it, how much does it make a difference? I it's not surprising you're getting 90x over the the interpreted execution. I'm just curious whether this 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 again the merging how much of that helps. Sure. Yeah. I'm fine. Stephen, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. Yeah. So this is um, the the caching problem that I was talking about. So, um, like like I said, our data sets are in the cloud, and there's a large latency. Um, and and the challenges are, uh, you know, a couple of challenges. One is that uh, the files that are going to be processed by a query depend on the query, uh, right? so especially with partition pooling. That's the first challenge. And the second challenge is that the columns that are read also depend on the query. Um, um, so it's not like we want to cache the entire path to five or anything like that. Right? And, and one of the things that we wanted to do was we said like zero administration. So no, so, so that ruled out like a num cache or a Redis kind of a solution. Uh, so we had to build our own homegrown uh, caching equivalent of it. Uh, so we decided to uh, cache files locally on 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 NVMe or SSD, uh, right, and manage that whole thing without uh, additional uh, infrastructure uh, that the customer had to install and and, and manage. Uh, one of the challenges that we did was like to 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 to, to get effective utilization of the cache. Uh, we, we really don't want the same file to be cached on each and every node in the execution engine. Right, so we ideally want uh, because that would not be utilizing the the combined uh, cache space on all the nodes. Uh, so uh, for a file, we ideally want to cache it on a single executed node or maybe a couple of executed nodes, not not everything. Um, and so we use uh, consistent hashing for that. Uh, so the way it works is that uh, um, the yeah. Uh, so the row count estimates and the cost uh, on the plan determine the parallelism of the scan operator and the parallelism uh, defines how many nodes need to be picked and 
uh, and once the nodes are picked, then, then then we use consistent hashing and take all these files that uh, we want to scan and map them onto and basically use consistent hashing to map them onto the nodes that we have picked at runtime at, at pre planning time, and 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 that's how we um, uh, ensure that the same file. Uh, that needs to be scanned multiple times goes to the same node again and again um, as much as possible, uh, and and that gives us uh, that uh, uh, so, so we're able to use the cache very effectively here. Um, and because this is a hundred terabyte cache, uh, uh, like our initial uh, 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 like, like initial eviction algorithm was, hey, let's implement a loop, right? Uh, but uh, but the the data structure, uh, the amount of memory that the LRU linked list with all its uh, the, the front and back pointers uh, requires uh, to hold all of it in memory uh, for the size of cache that we're talking about, right? Uh, turned out to be prohibitive. Right? So we, we don't have that kind of memory and we don't want to scale that kind of memory to, to implement eviction algorithm. So we ended up with a two phase eviction algorithm. The first eviction, the, 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 the algorithm first uh, identifies tables that are least recently accessed. Um, and, and we maintain all kinds of statistics about how often our data sets are accessed and which files are accessed in that and which portions of files are accessed within that. Um, and once the tables are identified, then then within those tables, we identify file chunks that are done. And, and all of this we, we use, uh, uh, we, yeah, so, so we do all of this without using too much memory. Uh, on the execution nodes. Yeah, so next slide, please. Yeah, so yeah. what is the chunk size you have here? So we use a one megabyte chunk size. Uh, like, yeah, large enough to, to, to take the hit of the latency, but still not small enough, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, about three minutes over. How much? How much more time you got? How many more slides? This is this is my last slide. I think we're done. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Keep going. Yeah. So um, runtime filtering gave us like an 8x performance improvement. And, and yeah, maybe I should just leave it here. And uh, so so different techniques give us different improvements on different types of queries. Uh, and that's how we're able to do interactive SQL queries on data sets in the cloud. I just, I just want to say this one thing about the, the runtime filtering 8x. Like, I'm not really sure exactly what that means because it's a little bit arbitrary. Like, we could we could design a use case that gives much bigger than that. In fact, I think some, some of our customers, for them, runtime filtering is, is a difference between the query completing in a few seconds versus never completing because they have the, it's kind of a bad query that they're running, but still, like, um, you know, they have, their query has all kinds of like cross joins and like just really nasty query and without runtime filtering, they it, it take forever. So it can actually have a much bigger than eight X improvement. So yeah, so uh, so I'm done. I'm, yeah. I'm done, Stephen. You can take it. All right, let me just uh, Q and A. But we'll just you know, since we're it's right out of time, I'll just put the the uh, obligatory that we're hiring slide. Uh, you go to dreamio.com slash careers. Hiring across all teams, um, yeah. Like, yeah. Hopefully, uh, if, if any of what we talked about interests you, uh, you know, check us out and um, come see if uh, you can join us. So, I'll just uh, stop sharing for now. All right, awesome. I will uh, clap on half of uh, the audience. Uh, so we have time for like one, maybe two questions from the audience if you if you want to go for it. So, how do you handle Correlated subqueries. This is the N square problem. Because for every tuple, you have to run them from every node and send across all the nodes to N square. Yeah. Well, so this is actually a functionality that's you know, handled by uh, by Calcite, and we decorrelate. Um, but the majority of correlated subqueries can be rewritten as a as a join. Um, that's that's the the quick answer. Um, uh, you know. There may be some category of correlated some queries that cannot be decorrelated that way, but they seem to be very rare. Um, I don't think we've had a, a come up with a, a customer not being able to have their queries uh, decorrelated. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, makes sense. I wrote the 
Seminole Coulee on, on Predicate. I mean, paper on that one. <laughs> in oh. 1995. It's all implemented in DB2 by 1988. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a class of uh, correlated subqueries. Like, if the correlated subquery itself has a, uh, you know, like a, a top in type, uh, you know, clause, uh, we don't handle that case. That's one example I know we don't handle. Um, I think that that would require. Uh, there, there is a way to decorrelate that using window functions, but uh, we don't have that uh, uh, yet. Maybe at some point. To be honest, I don't think it's ever come up. Like, or maybe maybe it's come up once from a customer. So. Um, in fact, I don't. I don't even know if the correlated subqueries are even that common at all. Like, it, yeah, because most vendors cannot handle it. Whereas in the traditional, like Oracle yeah. and DB2, they do a lot of it. Yeah. So that's why yeah. we did the correlation and conversion to yeah. window functions. Tried on DB2, it works. Yeah. 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 How many does yeah, he? It, how is a he's a he's an IBM research fellow. So he he mm -hmm. he's hiding behind no camera, but he knows databases. Okay. Great. Yeah. My, is it the MIR? Okay. So, yeah, nice. Anyway. Thank, thanks. Ex excellent, excellent question. Um, okay. Uh, the correlated right. subquery is a very challenging yeah, uh, yeah, topic. So, all right. Let me ask one question and then we'll, we'll, we'll call it quits. Um, how would you differ? What are the key, feature, key features that distinguish Dremio from maybe the other two main competitors in this space of a lake house, uh, Databricks and, and Presto or Trino? Like what makes, what in, in your opinion, what makes Dremio better? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, well, one area that we're trying to differentiate on is on performance, but that's, that's, that's a tough call. I mean, like, I, I think uh, we, we obviously have our benchmarks to show, hey, we outperform Trino and, and you know, but the other day we might, I, 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 I I think I think that that's important, but I don't like like to you know, stake our everything on that because you know the performance war is you know it comes to a back and forth and you can see it's not necessarily productive. You know we want to we want to be able to perform to help our customers. Um, so I, I think probably comes down to just the, uh, the things that we're focusing on: uh, the semantic layer, the ease of, of doing uh, the reflection, uh, the reflection feature, and you know, making it easy for users to create the materialized views to. Um, and so on. It is, is the it was one of the areas that um, uh, you know we're trying to differentiate on. And yeah, go on. Is, is, reflect, is reflection is that a Dremio concept and term, it's, or is that like? It's a, it's a, it, yeah, sorry. Uh, maybe I was broke, maybe I was breaking up when I was talking about it earlier. It's a it's a Dremio uh, uh, term that we use for materialized views, basically. Got it. But so. it's within a within a lake house or, or data lake, so it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I exactly. like it. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that term comes back from uh, like one aspect of Dremio that we, you know, early on, was like also this, the semantic layer, we really, we actually really emphasize the virtualization kind of aspect. And so that's what we have. We have terms like virtual data sets and physical data sets and reflections kind of reflects that point of view. Um, uh, but, you know, as we, we're focusing, we're, we're focusing more on the, you know, the data lake and the, the lake houses, is, you know, the, the, the metaphors kind of changed a little bit, but we're keeping some of the old terminology is how I put it. Okay. I think to add to, yeah, to, to add to what Steven said, I think it's the, so, so the materialized views on the reflections, but also the matching, right? The, the, the automatic matching algorithm that takes your SQL query and automatically, so that's what which reflection to use uh, to accelerate your query. Yeah. Stephen, Vivek, thank you so much for being here. I read, I was meant to, Vivek is in India, which is what, 4 a.m., 5 a.m. right now. So we appreciate you. You might be the winner for, for staying up the latest to give a talk. So we appreciate you uh, spending time with us.